role of the government and role of the government in terms of a facilitation mechanism, in terms of giving the access to some of these areas is very key. If I ask you today, tell me how many carpenters are required in this area within a one mile radius, and then extend it a little bit to say that how many carpenters, electricians, plumbers, welders, artisans, etc. are required to support a population. To be self-sustaining, you have got to do that. For a driver's job or a clerical job, the number of fellows with a master's degree and a bachelor's degree is what we are witnessing. That's the outcome of what we have created in some of these colleges. How difficult is the scaling um, challenge in a country with absolutely no standards at all? I mean, each ministry sort of has its own thing, the labor ministry has its own thing, the HRD is different, states uh, have their own sort of standards and programs. So is this is sort of having a centralized uh, standardization of what skills mean and what are the levels? Is that, is that perhaps the first thing to start off with? Yeah, I think the first thing to start off was to understand the multiple ministries which are trying to address it at the central level and then their interface with the state governments with regard to multiple ministries or state uh, departments. So many to many relationship with everyone has his own say was the most complex affair to just grapple the problem around and then understanding what this is all about. And then they had very specific state level initiatives or uh, certain regions, whether it's the tribal areas or the northeastern region or the JNK, etc., etc. So I think the complexity of the problem and understanding with no technology intervention was the most difficult thing. You know, I also feel that this killing we are not going to get anywhere because, you know, because the government is involved and because education is a state starting, like he said, you know, there's so many departments. So is there any other way to do this? I think there are multiple ways to do it. One is even if you take the private sector, and even if you take a group like Tata's or Billa's or Reliance or what have you, I think we have got manufacturing, we have got services, we may be in agro sector or whatever it is. And there is a mechanism to recruit train and then deploy and then reskill. So that's a continuous process. We also today do it only for ourselves and not for a third party. So when you are to do for a third party which is in the nation's interest, then there are mechanisms that have been put in place where as part of the CSR or as part of your own foundation come what may all part of your own contribution to their social cause, mechanisms are being put in place and through the government mechanisms or through your own mechanisms. I think some of those will definitely take effect. But at the end of the day, if you take a public school, government-aided school or a private school where every one of them has to go through a government machinery for implementation, you take the ITIs. You take the polytechnics. I think you just cannot, we cannot do in isolation. So shouldn't we just privatize these? No, I think I would say... If, we, if, we, if these were to be handed over to the big industrial groups, do you think each one would quote-unquote adopt one? <coughs> you know, because this way it's never going to happen. No, I think uh, when we go to the states, and I have visited personally quite a few of the states across the country, I think the hunger for learning in the youth is definitely very visible. Entrepreneurial energy is very visible. And we need to bring in the technology because the teacher shortage and the kind of things that go with it. I don't think it is within the corporate sector just by privatizing you are going to get that kind of a scale problem addressed. The role of the government and role of the government in terms of a facilitation mechanism, in terms of giving the access to some of these areas is very key. 
and that is why a public private partnership and the role of ngos also becomes very critical here if, if it is the case that there is a huge supply uh, a demand for learning skills and there is a huge uh, potential for job opportunities then why is that market not taking now first and foremost we have to understand this country has been used to unorganized sector as a way of employment generation 92 to 93 percent of the workforce in this country is in the unorganized sector only seven percent is in the organized sector the SME segment, the small and medium enterprises, employs almost 68 million people. That's the engine of employment rather than the big corporates. And big corporates know how to employ because they have a structured process. And we, that's the, not the numbers we are talking about. When we talk about a million kids coming into the job stream in addition to what is there to reskill and that are already employed, we have to make sure that we look at alternate mechanisms and we have to make sure that everybody participates in this journey for sure. We cannot just leave everything to the unorganized sector to make the transition from the unorganized to the organized sector through the recognition of prior learning where the youth has to be certified if I say that I have got a skill. What is the certification mechanism? Because who are the people who certify at the end of the day? A master weaver, does he certify? Or I certify as a professional when I don't know anything about weaving. So these are all the challenges we are facing to move from an unorganized to an organized sector. So within, uh, just, just trying to understand this, within the unorganized sector, when you look at the aggregate data, you will find some trends that we need so many X number of I was going to come to the supply demand. There is no demand side data available which is accurate. The data gathering and the data collection in this country is so poor that I don't even know what is the kind of job requirement within the small area where you are located as an office. Somebody has to do the detailed work. If I ask you today, tell me how many carpenters are required in this area within a one mile radius. And then extend it a little bit to say that how many carpenters, electricians, plumbers, welders, artisans, etc. are required to support a population to be self-sustaining, you got to do that. And if you give a mobile application as an example where I have a capability as a skill or I want to learn about a skill or I want to get certified on a skill, can I give you that empowerment because mobile permits today to do that? And you in turn are going to see, and at the end of it, if I say I can even do an earlier application on the mobile, let's ask you a set of questions to say that do you have the aptitude to do a certain thing? Do I give you some gaming software which tells you that if you play with this, suddenly you find a passion, you say it's of interest to me. Then I say immediately by a location nearest to your place, the, here is the training location where you can go, or here is a certification location you can go. And ultimately, what is the demand side where, with this skill, is it worth your while to go through this and you get a placement? Now, we extend it to 640 districts in the country because a district level job that is required for a local youth who is pay, uh, present in the district, the mapping has got to be done. This detailing is what we are seeking and it's going to take time. The engineering degrees and the MBA degrees, so they get the so-called fancy degrees, but they don't have skills. I mean, in terms of uh, whether they are able to do engineering jobs, they have almost zero skills from the kind of colleges they come out with. So, I mean, is there anything in the skill development program for those colleges for modifying the course content uh, for the, at least the second, third degree uh, uh, rank colleges in uh, smaller centers? No, I think the program I talked about where in any college, in addition to the regular curriculum or whatever they do, which doesn't get you anywhere, introduce the vocational education courses. At least they can do something beyond what they are doing. Otherwise, the thing we are witnessing is for a driver's job or a clerical job, the number of fellows with a master's degree and a bachelor's degree is what we are witnessing. That's the 
outcome of what we have created in some of these colleges. You go to the interior Andhra, we went there to Karimnagar and some of those areas. There are so many guys with degrees, some thousand colleges, 1100, no jobs. So they want to do anything. So the situation is forcing them to say that I don't, don't mind learning a trade. You know, we've become a very high cost economy in terms of wages and salaries where the productivity increase is not at all happening. So will this problem be solved now once uh, you know there are quote unquote more skilled people? Because it doesn't seem to be happening in any industry, including journalism. <laughs> you know, what where each some? batch the, the salary is not linked to productivity. You see the productivity is, right. is not increasing, which is why we have lost out. We have virtually exported our IT industry to the Philippines because we have become such a high wage economy that now we are no longer quote unquote competitive. And it's not only that, we even at a, in that, I mean local level. So how do we address that? I think the productivity has to be a part of the equation, number one. If I say you are a database analyst in the IT, what is the function of the database analyst? Is the eyes of the customer has to be very clear. If that person, the customer says that he's only a programmer and he's not a database analyst, then you're going to reflect in the uh, compensation you get or the service fee you get for that. That's very clear to the industry. At the same time, if Philippines is taking away the low-end jobs, it's like China took the low-end jobs away. It's very similar to manufacturing. So we have to be conscious of the fact that in any transition, in any evolution, certain jobs are going to go away. Not necessarily by some other lower-cost country taking it over, but also a level of automation which is going to bring in the kind of productivity that you need. There was some controversy about the CEO being removed rather abruptly. I think the CEO decided to leave. And immediately the chief operating officer also decided to leave. Now institution building, some of us have the experience that men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. So I think unless you have a plan of action to run the institution, you are not built the institution. So I had that experience in TCS, where one guy leaving, everybody thought the organization is going to fall down. But I'm not saying good people won't leave. Good people will leave because they're always under the radar of the other competitors. So I think we've got to accept it as a way of life.